very grateful to have with us Helen uh, Lenmore, who's an associate professor in political theory at, U at Yale University, uh, and also the author of uh, Open Democracy. Uh, and so without further ado, let me just invite uh, Helen to present a book for about 30 minutes, and then we'll have a Q&A at the end. Right, Helen, please. Thank you, Ben. Uh, thank you, everyone, for, for being here. So I'm going to share my, uh, my screen. So that's the book that uh, Ben just showed you. So it's a book that was uh, long in the making. I, I, um, I spent seven years writing it. I based it uh, on a lot of empirical research about the case of um, Iceland's constitutional process of 2010, 2013. And uh, also, more as a shadow case, because it sort of happened late in the, in the writing process, the French case of the Citizens' Convention for Climate, um, which is an assembly of 150 uh, randomly selected citizens tasked with coming up with proposals about how to fight climate change in France. And they just, as a matter of fact, concluded uh, the whole uh, series of, of meetings this past weekend with uh, an eighth uh, in concluding session where they were allowed to grade the way uh, the French government had implemented the recommendations. And it didn't go well. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. They were not too happy with the way the, the French government um, implemented the recommendations. But to me, both examples, the Icelandic example and the French example, um, illustrate what the, the beginning of what could be possible if we took the idea of popular rule seriously the idea of people's power seriously and um, tried to return to this initial Greek idea of democracy as exercise of power rather than this modern idea of representative democracy as you know, uh, a regime in which all we get to do is consent to the exercise of power by others, specifically elected others. So, what I'm going to do in the next 30 minutes is first tell you what's wrong with uh, representative democracy as we know it, because I think we've become so inward to, to its you know, flaws that we just don't see the problem, the conceptual problem with it anymore. I'm going to talk then about open democracy as, a, as my own parting of uh, popular rule, I, and I will defend it as a more authentic expression of the idea of people's power of popular rule. And in a third part, I will try to show you, uh, based on the case of uh, Iceland and, and, and France, that citizens actually can exercise power, exercise power, specifically they can even make the law, not just in the sense of authorizing it, but in the sense of writing it, which is uh, surprisingly counterintuitive to a lot of people. So I'll talk about those, um, you know, experiments as evidence for the larger theoretical claim. And then I'll turn to a, a brief concluding moment. Okay, so let's start with what's wrong with representative democracy. In order to diagnose the problem with representative democracy, we have to agree on the terms, right? So what does democracy mean? It means et etymologically people's power, demos, kratos. It also means, according to uh, the famous definition by Abraham Lincoln, rule of the people, for the people, and by the people. But what's interesting and what often gets um, overemphasized is uh, rule for the people by contrast with rule by the people. And so when we look at the um, contemporary institutional translations of rule by the people, we find out that it's not really by the people themselves, it's by um, a subset of the people, a group of um, elected uh, elites or elites competing for access to electoral positions. And we've come to see that as a sufficient proxy for rule by the people. So if you take the Freedom House definition, for example, uh, which is standard in political science departments, democracy is defined as a political system whose leaders are elected in competitive multi-party and multi-candidate processes in which opposition parties have a legitimate chance of attaining power or participating in power. And there's a long tradition behind this definition, which is uh, roughly Schumpeterian, where democracy is really not about the general will or any abstract met metaphysical notion like that, it's really not about exercise of power by the people in their collective capacity, because something that scared uh, the early founders of our uh, representative regimes. 
it's really much more about again competition among uh, parties and uh, alternance in power peaceful alternance in power of such parties and the uh, elites at their helm and it's not surprising if we look at the history of, of uh, representative democracy because what we call democracy today was historically born as a liberal republican mixed regime rather than a true or truly democratic regime the emphasis was again on um, you know individual rights the common good not so much about equal distribution of power so if you look at the federalist papers for example in the american case um, it's uh, constantly referring this uh, idea or an ideal of a republic and never the idea or ideal of a democracy so it's focusing on separation of powers checks and balances it's promoting a filter view of representation by contrast with a mirror view it's uh, you know embracing bicameralism and super majority constraints of all kinds it's in fact explicitly uh, meant as a non-democracy in uh, federalist paper number 63 written by madison clearly articulates this he writes the true distinction between between ancient governments meaning classical greece classical Athens, and the american governments lie lies in the total exclusion of the people in their collective capacity from any share in the latter and that's why to this day you still don't have any uh, possibility of a referendum for example at the at the federal level um, this was um, some people describe this as the agoraphobia or demophobia of the founders um, by contrast, so if you go back to the Ur model of democracy, um, for the Greeks, democracy meant ruling and being ruled in turn. It was truly about exercising power, not just consenting to it. Um, if we go to a later example of a um, uh, semi-democratic parliamentarian uh, regime in, in a, a medieval Iceland, the idea was something like no king except the law, there was a sense that uh, uh, you know uh, absence of domination absence of uh, rulers um, was synonymous with democracy we were ourselves the rulers or well, they were ourselves themselves the rulers modern de representative democracies by contrast basically um, consist of the vast majority of us being ruled by a professional elected elites few thousand people rotating in and out of power but the rest of us are kind of like shut out uh, from that world and surprisingly, when we look at, uh, for example, um, what's considered a beacon of democracy in the world, or was until recently, the American Congress, we find that the re-election rate for the American Congress is 90%. So there's actually very little turnover. But surprisingly, or perhaps not so surprisingly, actually, the approval rate of that Congress is around 13%. Uh, I think the historical law, law was around 9%, and the highest uh, since uh, these measures started being taken in the late 70s was 33 percent so at no point in history um, as far as we know um, could measure it as the american congress garnered more than 33 percent rate of approval that sounds um not not a very good score or not a very satisfactory regime form some people have even argued that in fact we are not truly in democracies uh, we are in elected oligarchies or elected plutocracies even meaning um, ruled by the rich or uh, ruled by um, you know economic interest uh, group interests interest groups that would be the famous article by uh, Martin Gillens and Benjamin Page of 2014 where they show that um, and of course this is debatable and, and has been um, uh, sort of uh, empirically criticized in all kinds of ways but it's still an interesting and, and uh, plausible um, claim that there's no um, causal effect once you control for the preferences of the uh richest in america of majorities on public policy uh, if true that's um, a very um, uh, you know unsettling uh, fact but if we look at the theory of politics in general it turns out we are still platonician we still believe in rule by the best and the brightest um, we still believe in the confidence men we still believe in identifying the better amongst ourselves to rule over ourselves and if you look at the best normative series of representative democracy, the one, the democracy, the one that are most inspiring and most democratic, truly, uh, you find that there's still a sort of divide between the ruling group and the ruled group. 
that to me is, uh, is in fact problematic. So if you look at Habermas and his vision of a two-track public sphere, um, you find that in track one, the center of decision-making power, you have elected officials, administrations, agencies. And in track two, you have ordinary citizens, the people who supposedly through, um, you know, um, flaws of communication that are unregulated can set the agenda for track one, uh, where decisions get made. And supposedly there's a sort of circular relationship between these two spheres and um, and uh, responsiveness of track one to track two and a causal influence of track two on, tra on track one. And yet somehow, uh, you know, we are not really living in democracies that seem to be uh, matching that normative reconstruction of, of the real. Everywhere you look at the moment, you see discontent, you see um, unhappiness, uh, whether it's a uh, protest against uh, the European Union and decision to leave it with the Brexit uh, referendum, whether it's a yellow vest in France that protested um, a fuel tax, a diesel tax in November 2018, and then went on to, you know, uh, demonstrate on the Champs-Élysées and, and uh, with the support of the vast majority of the French population, whether it's a Black Lives Matter movement in the US, whether it's uh, the protests in Chile that uh, have recently led to a complete constitutional um, uh, upheaval and, and uh, what looks like, like a, a moment of refoundation. Uh, so obviously, uh, representative democracy, if it ever was, um, for the people no longer seems to be working. People are frustrated. Um, to my mind, as I explained in the book, I think it's because elections are, uh, as Bernard Manin long ago said in his book, The Principles of Representative Government, an aristocratic uh, selection mechanism that empower an, a biased sample of the population that distribute power unequally with the resulting outcome that uh, these elites have blind spots. They can't really track um, the common good in the right way, um, and that creates um, dissatisfaction. Why is it that uh, it's problematic to exclude some people via this election this selection mechanism of election? Because the true argument for a democracy, the real argument for democracy, um, as in fact, always been that we are smarter when we uh, are all together included in the decision-making process. So an old insight, you can find it in Aristotle, you can find it in um, uh, later authors uh, uh, like uh, uh, Condorcet, it's more, the more aggregative version of it, but you can also find it in, um, in much more recent uh, political theories like um, W.E.B. Du Bois, I think he puts it best. He says, the real argument for democracy is this. I quote, in the people, we have the source of that endless life and unbounded wisdom, which the rulers of men must have. And when the rulers of men um, are too disconnected from the concerns and, and, and um, interests of the larger populace, they miss out on crucial information, crucial perspectives, and they they basically lack in wisdom. This insight by Du Bois, he, he, he specifies even further this way, I quote, the vast and wonderful knowledge of this universe is locked in the bosoms of its individual souls. To tap this mighty reservoir of experience, knowledge, beauty, love, and deed, we must appeal not to a few, not to some souls, but to all. So the idea is that a subset cannot rule for another subset for epistemic, meaning knowledge-related reasons, and that individuals need the vote, whether they want it or not, uh, because it's um, better for them and better for all of us. So not just because of uh, things having to do with uh, equality or consent, but truly for um, instrumental reasons. So I put in, in blue the, the, the dimensions that have to do more with what we think of when we think of knowledge. Uh, but in fact, he's, he has a very all-encompassing vision of what it takes to be wise, um, Du Bois. He thinks that it's also about an aesthetic sense, beauty. It's also about an emotional um, uh, dimension, because emotions matter to the, the, the justice and, and quality of the policies we put forward. So love is, a, is of great concern. Um, 
indeed, is, is a, I, I suppose I take it to reference the kind of prudential knowledge that you can only uh, really have from a lived experience. And that's what also um, uh, needs to be in the center of, of power uh, in order for the policies to, to match the needs of the larger populations. So in other words, when you exclude people from representation, which is the case in the sort of unequal representation we get in electoral regimes, you lose in wisdom. And so even rule by the most virtuous few, the best and brightest, might not result in rule for the people. So at least that's how I diagnose the problem in my book and how I, I, I can say that we're never going to fix electoral democracies until we fix the selection mechanism uh, through which we, we choose our, our, um, our rulers, right? So um, let's turn now to the more positive vision for, for democracy. So I call it open democracy to uh, refer to the fact that the center of power is accessible, open, to all people in an inclusive manner. The idea is that it's ruled by the people in the sense that everyone has an equal chance of accessing this center of power, which for me is, is the legislative power. We can talk about the question of the judiciary and the question of the executive, but really for me, legislation is, is the heart of the matter. However, what, what I'm advocating for is not a direct rule. It's not all of us ruling en masse, uh, deliberating en masse, voting en masse all the time, because that to me sounds, um, is uh, both undesirable and impractical. I explained that in a, in a chapter of the book. And it's not a mixed regime either, because as I just said, for me, the legislative power determines the nature of the rule. And um, I have a preference for a system in which the legislative power is um, uh, the first power, if you want, and the executive and the judiciary are subordinated to it. OK, so open democracy, in other words, is a is a vision or a parting for a new kind of, of, uh, of democracy. As such, it's not um, utterly detailed, um, but it's really more of a, of a lens through which to see uh, the world, but also to see existing regimes. And, and, and um, it's a lens that allows us to see the problems with the existing system and, and to envision something different and something it might be better. So to summarize, I call it, uh, I define it as a new paradigm of democracy that takes seriously the ideal of popular rule as ruled by the people and recovers the op openness of earlier democratic practice, practices. So in the book, I take for granted until the very last chapter, the framework of the nation state. Um, I do think that there are good reasons to question that scale, um, but as a preliminary step and in order to have something that I can keep constant, I only um, reason within that, that framework. And within that framework, I envision open democracy as um, structured by five institutional principles. And these five institutional principles are participation rights, deliberation, the majoritarian principle, democratic representation, and transparency. I've tried as best as I could to be very parsimonious. I could, have, I could have had 10 principles, 12 principles. I've tried to really limit myself to the five that I thought were really um, crucial. So the first one, participation rights, is about empowering people. It's about giving them the tools to become invested in politics, to become active participants in, politi in politics, if they so desire. So of course, they would have voting rights, rights of association, etc. But importantly, they should also be equipped with um, so-called citizens initiative and um, right of referral. So these rights allow people to put something on the agenda of a parliament uh, when they reach a sufficient number of signatures, for example. It also allows them to call for a referendum on a particular law through this right of referral when they're not happy with the consequences of the law or, um, or its uh, object or, or anything that they are unhappy with, if they can gather a critical mass of citizens to agree with them, they can um, launch a referendum on that issue. Uh, so similarly, uh, they can directly initiate a, a referendum on a, on a topic of their choice, whether it's animal rights or, or, or some other issue, if they, if they so choose. So basically just putting the initiative and the, uh, and the power back in the hands of citizens. Deliberation 
is the second uh, institutional principle because um, I com I'm committed to this uh, normative ideal of deliberative democracy developed in the 90s, uh, 1990s by people like uh, Jürgen Habermas, Josh Cohen, John Rawls, to a degree. And I see uh, deliberation not just as an ideal, which is you know, inclusive and democratic, but also as a technology we have yet to fully master. And it's important to embed um, the practice and the technology of, of uh, deliberation in our institutions. And if you start looking at actual institutions, you realize that very little um, is actually authentically deliberative in, in, the, in the way the, the, the theory demands. The third principle is the majoritarian principle. In a way, it's the principle that goes the most without saying. And yet, if you look around again, you find that it's constantly violated. Um, we are hampered uh, in, in the existing regime by all kinds of super majoritarian thresholds, filibuster rules, uh, bicameral design that sort of thwart, that are designed to thwart the majoritarian will. Uh, and yet, I think that at the end of the day, if you face, if you have to face the choice, it's either going to be minority rule or majority rule. And I think this liberal Republican tradition I was talking about earlier has been panicked at the thought of major tyranny of the majority to the point that they've they've chosen to tilt the the design in favor of uh, super majority and constraints that in the end have empowered powerful minorities much more so than they've protected vulnerable minorities. So I think we need to till the uh, swing the pendulum the other way, if you will. And when I say the, the majoritarian principle, I, I, um, I don't need to commit to a particular version of it. In fact, there are a range, uh, there is a range of options, including something called majority judgment, which is a sort of rating system, which is a lot more um, precise in its evaluation of, uh, of the options. And so this is something that could also be implemented in, a, in an open democracy. The fourth principle, democratic representation, is so the most subtle in some ways, because I do acknowledge that we need some form of representation in a very minimal sense, in the sense of uh, having people who do things on our behalf in a way that um, uh, is uh, accepted by us and recognized by the, by, uh, by the larger system. But somehow we've, uh, as we've identified democratic representation with electoral representation, when in fact, I think it's, it's an oligarchic form of representation because it's based on this principle of distinction uh, that Bernard Manin diagnosed a long time ago. It means that we need to identify the better amongst ourselves uh, on, on, uh, by, by some standard we define ourselves. Democratic representation, by contrast, distributes power equally. It's equal representation, basically. And to me, um, there are two forms that match this ideal much better. I call it, uh, I call the first one lotocratic representation and the second one self-selective representation. Lotocratic representation is basically the concept, the, 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 the principle of one person, one lottery ticket. Just like in ancient Athens, we'd be able to access positions of uh, power uh, via a lottery, via just um, you know, a, a random draw. Uh, an example of that already exists. We, we have citizens' assemblies, the French uh, Convention for Climate, things like that, mini publics of all kinds. Self-selected representation is another form of uh, democratic representation in the sense that when you join um, a demonstration, when you um, join a Landsgemeinde meeting in Switzerland, when you join a um, participatory budgeting uh, experiment, anyone has the same chance in theory to 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 have access to that space in fact it's more open to some degrees than than uh, mini publics because you don't even need to win a, uh, the lottery uh, so i think this is an important form of democratic representation it has its pros and cons and uh, can probably only be used for certain specific tasks but it's a very valuable form of representation and finally there's liquid representation which is my third and, and more ambiguous form of democratic representation it's a it's 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 if you want the the principle of choice maintained but not as in elections um, uh, in a restrictive way so where you you can only um, choose among a, a limited uh, number of candidates carefully handpicked by parties in liquid representation you can delegate your vote to absolutely anyone you want or retain the right to vote directly on any issue so to me, even if it looks like a very democratized form of electoral representation, it's so different and so much more inclusive and egalitarian that I, that I prefer to give it its own label. 
Um, and so I call it liquid representation. I, I do have some issues about the implementations and it's a very, very new practice or, or principle. So I think that uh, I'm still a little cautious about it. So I, as I said, I talked about mini publics as illustrations of a uh, lotocratic representation. You also have deliberative polls, national forums, citizen juries, etc. cetera. Um, I, I, the, the beauty of a uh, lotocratic representation is that it gives you descriptive representation. It gives you, um, when the samples are large enough at least, a mini portrait of the nation or of the, of the group. And that has the merits that I, I already um, attributed to the analysis of Du Bois, um, that you make sure people with the right knowledge are in the group, that all the perspectives that matter are represented. And why is that? Why can't you exclude people? Again, Du Bois writes, with the best will and knowledge, no man can know women's wants as well as women themselves. To disenfranchise women is deliberately to turn from knowledge and grow up in ignorance. One could say the thing, same thing about uh, blacks and whites, uh, about um, vegetarians versus you know, meat eaters. I mean, the, the, it's just the fact that um, there's a knowledge that comes from a lived experience that needs to be, um, that, that, that is only tapped when you use things like uh, random selection. Self-selected representation, just to illustrate briefly, um, you have uh, the Gram Sabhas of India, you have uh, demonstrations, you have uh, um, you know, things like the Yellow Vest movement, you have self-selected representatives of the youth like uh, Greta Thunberg, um, and they all play a role in increasing the diversity of voices in, uh, in the public sphere. And liquid representation, I touched on it briefly. It's something that's typically used more in a uh, online uh, uh, systems. Uh, so the German uh, parties and, and um, Swedish parties, like the DemoX, used it internally um, to design their own platforms amongst uh, the party members. The fifth principle, and I'm almost done, I promise, um, is the fifth institutional principle of open democracy is transparency. This principle is just there to guarantee a form of accountability because the minute you have representation, the minute you have a, a delegation of, of power to a subset, even a very representative subset, uh, even one that, that's not in power for a long time and will you know, rotate um, very quickly, there's a danger of um, uh, you know, capture, corruption, uh, mistakes, and so it's very important to maintain uh, transparency, um, you know, vertical transparency between the represented and, um, and, the, and the represented, the representatives and the represented, and horizontal transparency amongst all the people involved in these conversations at, at multiple levels. So transparency, I see more as, a, as an accountability mechanism, if you want, uh, for the whole design. So this has been very abstract so far. Uh, I was talking about the, the, the building blocks, the institutional building blocks of, um, uh, at the theoretical level of, of an open democracy. There are many objections to everything I've said so far, but one of them is very practical. This design assumes that citizens can measure up to the legislative task, basically. You want to empower them to join you know, mini publics that will set an agenda for the rest of the country, potentially make laws uh, for the rest of the country. Do we have any evidence that this is workable and practical? So I'm going to talk very briefly about um, these prior examples. Um, they are not perfect implementations of what I have in mind by open democracy, but they give us a taste of what could be feasible in the future. So in Iceland, in 2008, uh, there was a major financial crisis. Um, and in 2010, the parliament decided it was time to uh, you know, uh, rewrite in a fundamental way the social contract of the nation, and it's, it's specifically this constitution that they had inherited from the Danish uh, monarchy in 1944, which was really outdated, archaic, and which they blamed in part for the, the, the 2008 mess. But they decided to rewrite the social contract in a very innovative fashion. They appointed first, uh, they, they randomly selected first uh, a national forum of 950 randomly selected citizens who, for a day, brainstormed about the values and ideas they most wanted to see encoded in their new social contract. 
Then they organize an election to pick the 25 constitution drafters, and they excluded from the pool of, of candidates all uh, officials and um, uh, people in power and uh, elected people. They, they just thought these people have been disqualified. The, the 2000 crisis proved how corrupt they are. We want a new batch, a fresh batch of, of people. So that brought to power a very interesting group, uh, as you can see on the picture, uh, half men, half women, almost. Um, uh, on the foreground, uh, you have uh, Freya Harald Zotia, who um, is a, a human rights activist and also a sever severely disabled person. Um, you had a, a student, you had a, a union member, you, you had a very diverse group of, of, uh, of profiles, perhaps not as diverse as you would get uh, with a random draw. Obviously, those people who are very educated, very urban, somewhat elite in some way, but um, just not your usual, um, perhaps, um, parliamentarian group. Um, and they, over the course of four months, these people um, wrote a brand new constitutional proposal, and they did so themselves in innovative ways, in the sense that they put online for everyone to see and the whole co country to contribute, 11 drafts of their constitutional proposal, and they did their best to include the feedback in that draft. Eventually, um, the, the proposal went to a referendum where it was uh, adopted by two thirds of the voting population. Um, and to me, regardless of the fact that, you know, Parliament eventually didn't vote that uh, proposal um, into law, so that Iceland is still stuck with its 1944 constitution, regardless of this semi-failure, what happened there is that the Icelanders proved that ordinary citizens or almost ordinary citizens can together write a constitution, can write a fundamental text in a way that's perfectly competent. And, uh, and, and, and so they, they've established something that uh, I think most people were not sure about before. Now, what happened with the French case? So the problem with the Icelandic case is that it, you know, it's a tiny, tiny nation of 320,000 people, so you know, mid-sized city in the US. Um, it's very homogeneous very Christian, very white. So an objection, an easy objection is to say, look, I mean, this can happen there. It could never happen anywhere else. But what just happened in France to me uh, shows that that's not true, that scale is not an issue and that diversity is not an issue because France is a 67 million people nation. It's very diverse at this point, very multicultural. And, 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 and um, what has happened in the last uh, 12 months is that a group of 150 randomly selected citizens were brought together for um, eight weekends in total, but seven really for the task of, of, of making the law proposals to offer solutions to the problem of green gas emissions in France. So their task was, um, so they, they gathered in this beautiful building that you see here, it's a brutalist building uh, called the, the Jena Palace in the middle of Paris. And this is a picture here of, um, of the 150 with some of the members of the governance committee as well. Um, and they worked really hard with the help of many experts um, uh, to answer the following question. How to reduce Fran the following mandate. How to reduce France green gas emissions by 40% of the 1990s levels by 2030 in the spirit of social justice. Uh, it's basically a problem that the government had failed to solve just a year earlier uh, when they tried to you know, implement this fuel tax and then they had to retract it because it created this um, uh, rebellion of the yellow vest, right? So because the government can't solve this issue, they hand the hot potato to the French um, population or, or a sample of it. And they say, look, okay, you, you, then you do it. Um, and, and really the requirement was that they, they should produce very, very specific proposals, almost like, uh, you know, quasi bills in a way, so that they could be uh, sent uh, without filtering as Macron had promised, either to direct regulation, to um, uh, a referendum or to a parliamentary debate. And the thing is that, you know, they met despite the pandemic, despite social movements. And, um, you know, they made enormous progress between the beginning when they didn't know all that much to the end where they have become almost experts on some issues. 
and uh, they delivered. They delivered 149 proposals. So here are a few of the a few pictures that illustrate the process. And and here you have the use of random selection to allow people to different subgroups um, throughout the <coughs> throughout the experience. Um, and so again, this experience to me um, uh, is um, is a success in, in many ways. And I, I hasten to say that, like the Icelandic um, uh, experiment, it was open to the larger public. They made, they did their best to connect to the larger um, uh, French nation through the media, through Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, social media. <coughs> they organized their own local meetings to educate the population about their work. They met with regional officials. They met also now in the, in the last six months with ministers, with parliamentarians, etc. They created their own association, the Association of the 150, to continue their work in parallel to the work of the convention. Um, and so, to me, what what has happened, and it's, it's quite a land, you know, a historical moment uh, for France, and I'm, I'm hoping the world, is that the French convention has proved that citizens of a large multicultural country can actually write the law on a complex question like, um, like uh, climate change. And so, of course, they didn't write the law in a, in a legal sense because um, the constitution doesn't allow that to happen and they don't have a legal status currently and they owe their authority only to the, pre from the, to, to the president. So we would need a constitutional change for them to actually have the, the legal standing to make the law. But in practice, it's pretty much what, what has happened to my mind. So the question is, should we not, why don't we give them more power in existing institutions? Okay, I'm, I'm turning to my conclusions in, in a very briefly. So in the book, I defend um, the a central institution, which I call the open mini public. So the open mini public is basically a group, a large group of uh, randomly selected representatives that are connected to the larger nation, to the larger public through uh, all kinds of methods, uh, crowdsourcing, um, uh, you know, social media, uh, online platforms, etc. Perhaps uh, connected to other uh, lotocratic representatives at the, at, the, at the lower level. And uh, this is something you could use for, you know, uh, the legislative power, but also for uh, reforms of the administrative state, um, uh, for reforms of the judiciary as well. Um, this is something that I think would, would, uh, would translate into all kinds of settings. And so the idea is that we would move from, you know, if you remember the Habermasian two-track model I introduced at the beginning, this is where we are. In the best case scenario, that's where we are. Two tracks with elected officials, you know, basically staying in power indefinitely. And the rest of us stuck in this outside bubble, trying to influence the first track. And what we could do, of course, is just create an intermediary track to get closer to the first track in a more structured way. And I think that um, what Macron, President Macron did with his great national debate prior to the Convention for Climate was an effort in that direction. But to me, um, that still wouldn't be enough. I think what we need to do is bring people inside the first track. So my sense is that my ideal would look much more like this. Um, people rotating in and out of all the places of power, but especially the legislative power, not staying there very long, not staying there long enough that Power becomes stagnant, power has become corrupt, power becomes biased in a certain direction. And so um, I'm not, I don't have the, the ideal sort of a pictorial representation for this, but it would look a lot more like this than a, in a sort of a dichotomous um, uh, you know, a series of tracks. Okay, so I'll stop here. That's roughly the, 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 you know, the, the main ideas in the book. Uh, there are others about accountability, about other things, but I, I, I look forward to the Q&A to explore more of them uh, with you. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you so much, Helen. That was a very uh, engaging and concise uh, exploration of the themes covered in the book. So I guess I'll lead off with a few questions and then we'll open to the floor uh, for the ensuing discussion. So, you know, I, I was very interested in this book because like many people I've been uh, disenchanted with electoral democracy. It seems like some people are always on the inside and the rest of us are just looking in. And so I'm gonna offer some comments first on the theoretical level, then on the uh, more practical level about how the ideas uh, can work. And so I'll just start by noting that the definition of representation 
And this book is very broad. So I actually copied it down. It says the act of standing for someone else, individual or group that is recognized and accepted as such uh, by a relevant audience. And that's a very suitable uh, kind of definition to begin with. But something I wonder, you know, uh, within the scope of this definition is the responsibility of the representatives, right? So in the book, you discuss uh, ancient Athens and you discuss the general assembly. And, you know, if you didn't arrive on time, you may be excluded, especially when they started offering people money. Uh, and so there's the idea there that the, the subset of the populace that shows up is acting for the whole. But I wonder what's the responsibility of a representative in that case, right? Could you be said to be really representing someone else in the sense of considering their interests, uh, kind of conveying their views? And this matters because uh, at the heart of open democracy is uh, this uh, uh, lotocracy, right? Some people are going to be chosen by lot uh, to exercise power. And so I wonder how are they supposed to engage in deliberation, right? Are they supposed to just say what your views are? Are they supposed to maybe even set aside your views if they think it's not perfectly representative uh, of the group uh, they are from? And if they're supposed to be from a particular group, how do we define the group, right? So a lot of it is gender and race and you can quote a, you can quote a sample based on that, right? Just like how people do public opinion polls. But is that always the best way to define the relevant groups, right? Both for ep epistemic purposes uh, and for purposes of, le of legitimacy. So that's uh, the kind of uh, theme I want to work with. Uh, and the second kind of follow-up question, very much in the same vein, uh, is a question that has kind of plagued deliberative democracy. You know, I'm very attracted to the idea of deliberative democracy, uh, but at the end of the day, we have to make decisions. And oftentimes it just comes down to a vote. And so the question is when they vote, how are they supposed to do that? Uh, are they supposed to just say what they prefer at the end of the deliberative process, right? They've come to a certain view and this is their preference. Or are they supposed to vote based on what they now think uh, is, is going to advance the common good, right? So in the first case, it kind of reverts back to the aggregative model. Granted, of course, the preferences are not given. They're kind of formed and shaped through deliberation. But, but it is still, in a sense, aggregative, right? You're trying to gather you know, people's preferences and, and into some kind of, you know, uh, a social choice function and spit out a result? Or is it more kind of in the, in the spirit of the Condorcet jury, jury theorem, right? You have people trying to take their best shot at what's, in the com, uh, what's best for the common good. And hopefully, you know, when you get out of your wisdom, you're gonna be closer to the truth, right? So what kind of attitude, what kind of mindset should they be in when, when the deliberation concludes and they have to make uh, a decision? Uh, sticking with the theory, and this is the last theory point, you know, I, I noticed that supermajority rule comes in for some, some severe criticism uh, in the book. Uh, but I wonder if it's not defensible in some way, you know, and, and you know, when I read this, I really recall uh, this essay, which I think you, you do cite in the book uh, by Benjamin Constant uh, many years ago on the difference between the li liberties of ancients and moderns. Uh, and it kind of suggests that, you know, the, the liberty of the moderns is really the liberty to be left alone in a sense, right? Because he said, when you, in, in the times of the ancients, right, you, you had a lot of power over people's lives, but you also really shared in that power. Whereas, whereas uh, in modern times you don't, right? So whatever share of political power you have, it's so limited that, that you know, what we should be worried about, what, what, the, what the freedom of the, the liberty of the moderns consists in, is really limiting uh, the, the kind of reach of government. And I wonder if you know, there might not be an argument for the supermajority rule in that case, right? It's not really rule of the minority because the minority really only has a veto power, uh, but it's really constraining government, like preserving a kind of public, a private sphere that can be free even from you know, uh, open democracy. And finally, I want to come down to the practical uh, uh, side of things. And, and you know, I find the Iceland and, and French example very interesting. And of course you don't try to uh, make big claims with those examples. You're just trying to show it's possible. But, but I wonder if you know, uh, open democracy is really possible at a more down to earth level. The, the reason why I say that is because when we talk about constitutions, we talk about climate change, we may be able to find people willing to spend their time or actually excited uh, about this. But when it comes to the more day to day uh, tasks of you know, uh, you know, legislation or even regulation, right, implementing regulations, I wonder if people will be as excited or if they will try as they do now to avoid jury duty. And, and, and you know, one example uh, I have in mind is the American example, which uh, in administrative law, people are allowed to post comments uh, on regulations on this website called regulations.gov. And if you post comments, they do have a real effect. Uh, the agency has to address 
your comments with some cogency. Otherwise, the rule might be struck down in court if they haven't kind of explained why they have dismissed or kind of adjusted something in response to a comment. But nevertheless, I think it's conventional wisdom that almost no real citizens uh, post on the website. You know, it's mostly industry groups, lawyers hired by industry groups and bots until recently. Uh, and I, so, so I wonder, you know, on the one hand, it could be a lack of knowledge that this process is available. But on the other hand, I wonder if it's just, you know, uh, a kind of apathy, right? So, you know, open democracy is great when we're talking about uh, exciting, heady uh, constitutional rights. But when we are talking about a day-to-day -day task of governing, you know, I wonder if it's going to be all that uh, workable. Right, so, so thank you, Helen. You know, I've spoken for a while now uh, and I'm going to uh, leave it here. You know, you can respond or you can uh, save it uh, and, and uh, for, for kind of addressing with other questions. Um, you know, I, I'd be curious to get the, all the questions and I can see if they, if, uh, they merge with yours so I can address them as a whole. Okay, uh, great. So, so far we have, um, oh, well, we have someone asking for the slides. Um, okay, someone has a very practical question. Uh, I'm loving the book. You know, I'm a user experience designer and understand the openness really relies on a well-designed platform like open source or Wikipedia example show. Uh, are you considering working or designing an actual technological prototype for new applications of open democracy? Uh, are you actually working <laughs> on any well, kind of platform? Yeah, or consulting no, for any kind of platform? The answer is no, I, I'm terrible right. at technological <laughs> things, so. But thank you, I appreciate the comments. It's really nice. Okay, and uh, Alex, Alex, you're next. You, you want to jump the queue? Yeah, yeah Alex, that's okay. Mic, yeah. Can uh, I take that back? Can, can, sorry, sorry, Alex, I just had a thought, which, you know what, it's not true. I'm not that terrible at technology and I'm actually working on a platform to some degree, just, just occur to me. So here's an example. I'm on the Senate of my uh, university uh, at Yale. I got in, on there because once I got tenure, I realized, oh my God, this is political. Um, we need to give more powers to faculty in this university. So I got on there and then I realized we communicate via email. This is so inefficient, so pathetic. You know, documents get lost. You have to go back three months to, to like figure out what somebody said. And so I said, listen, we have to use a platform like, like the things I've had been you know, observing and, and using myself in these experiments in Iceland, in Finland, in France, because we, we, we will never be efficient if we don't do that. And we are completely opaque to the rest of the faculty, to our constituency that elected us. We're opaque to ourselves. We don't know who's working on what at any point in time. So I got in touch with one of the um, organizers of the, of the French convention and I asked them to design a platform for us. And so actually I am, I am actually <laughs> helping um, push through a new, a new uh, communication method amongst ourselves. Um, well, that, that's a, yeah, thank you so much for reminding me of that. Just very quickly, you know, a, a, a follow up question from the, the audience before Alex, you come in, because this is exactly on point. Uh, someone's asking, you know, whether your activist groups or other communities trying to put this into practice that we can learn about and support, you know, people are convinced. So they're trying to uh, see what what they can do to promote open democracy. Are there examples? Um, I, I, um... Are there activist groups or other communities that are trying to implement this? Oh, yes, there are there are a lot of people. You know, it's not it's not like all these ideas are, are terribly new either. I mean, I, I you know I try to give them a sort of package that's uh, as comprehensive as possible. So I think that's new, and some of the theoretical foundations are hopefully are a bit new. But there are many people who've thought of designs like this before. You have Terry Borisius. Um, you have a 2017 book that I just saw on uh, online that I think uh, is very well worth checking out. With like five types of you know uh, randomly selected bodies. You have um, John Gastil and uh, Eric Olin Wright who published um, a book uh, called um, a Legislature by Lot. I mean, these are still somewhat theoretical ideas, but they are, they are activists in some way. They're pushing for exploring new, new formats, new, new roles for citizens. Uh, you have Arash Abizadeh who um, wrote a paper uh, in Perspective on Politics uh, two years ago about how to reform the, um, the Canadian Senate and turn it, abolish the, the Canadian Senate and turn it into a randomly selected um, chamber. You have French activists who are pushing for similar ideas, uh, House of the Future, where this randomly selected chamber would think about long-term goals like uh, sustainable economy, etc. So yes, it's everywhere. If you start looking, you'll see um, there are resources uh, online that I'd be happy to send you. 
Okay, uh, excellent. Alex, why don't you go first and then I'll ask Albert's question. Okay, yeah, th well, thank you very much, Alan. It's a really, um, really inspiring project uh, that the book uh, comes out of. And uh, I think that's reflected in the enthusiasm uh, in some of the questions that we've seen here today. So I don't mean to rain on the enthusiasm, but I do have a kind of, I'm a sort of a pessimistic, <laughs> I'm a pessimistic soul. And so my mind just immediately gravitates to thinking, uh, what would be the, what are the likely pathologies of, of any particular institutional arrangement? Like, you know, I, I think kind of every institution has its own sort of special pathological kind of tendencies. So I, and I was reminded when you were speaking about this of, you remember from, from the Republic of Florence and uh, Renaissance Italy, they had this arrangement where citizens uh, or at least members of the guilds in the city would take turns in government. And, and when you first hear about that, it sounds really great. And then you discover very soon after that the entire thing was gamed uh, very much by particular families uh, to control the city uh, government. And so I'm wondering, you know, what sort of gaming might we anticipate here? Um, what role might there still be for political parties in this? And might they have a corrupting influence or at least um, maybe maybe distorting influence on, on this process? So what, what sort of pathologies do you envision for this kind of uh, arrangement? And, and then why do you think that those pathologies aren't too damning or too, um, why shouldn't we be too worried about them? Um, no, it's good to be pessimistic. You want to design for the worst too, right? But um, I think first of all, we have to remind ourselves the question is always comparative. Compared to what are the pathologies of a sortition-based system, better or worse? And at this point, I think the, the electoral system has, you know, is in such crisis that, you know, it, it starts to, 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 to make the other alternatives look a lot better. So I think um, the likely pathologies of, of a randomly selected uh, you know, system is that you could say, well, you'll bring in too many ignorant people, right? Too many ignorant people who don't have the incentives or the desires or the time to focus on lawmaking. And um, what, what will happen is that they'll just follow whatever the experts that help them come up with solutions say, right? They'll, it, it will be captured by the apparatus, the permanent apparatus surrounding these, these uh, transitory citizens who rotate in and out of power. So that's a very good objection. Empirically, that's not what um, I've observed in the case of the Citizens' Convention for Climate. In fact, if anything, um, the citizens were extremely suspicious of experts at the beginning. Um, they didn't want to, they were very much afraid of being um, instrumentalized by government to push an agenda that wasn't theirs, to, you know, follow a solution that they knew the rest of the French uh, people dis disliked, like the carbon tax, which, you know, was, uh, you know the fuel tax was, was in a way a de facto carbon tax. So the, 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 the trust between experts and, and, uh, and citizens took some time to, to gel. And yes, the experts sort of had an influence, but I think it was an, a deserved influence in the sense that they were followed, followed by the citizens when their arguments were good or the recommendations were good. And I can't say I saw any type of capture in that case. Um, that's partly because I think if you do the design right, people have the right incentives to become passionate about these issues. They, 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 they at least thought for a long time that it would matter because uh, President Macron had promised them that you know, their recommendations would go without filtering to direct application, a referendum or a parliamentary debate. So they cared passionately. I've never seen, you know, honestly, these people were passionate. They were all in. Um, some people dropped out, that's you know, predictable. Some people came in initially just for the money um, or, you know, and, and I think many of them stayed for the friendship. And even if they didn't participate much, well, they were there at least, you know, they, it, it's one thing to legislate about, um, you know, uh, renters and, uh, you know, uh, owners, but then you have to talk to these people. And even if there's this like woman who's not very active and she's just here, you know, and she doesn't speak much, but she's still here. And, and you know of her life experience because she's shared it and, and you have to justify your, your, your choice to her and her. And, and she will have a, a lived experience of being a renter that, you know, you can't just wish away uh, the way you can when you're in a parliament where nobody's poor and, and uh, you know, having a hard time uh, paying the rent at the end of the month. 
So things like that. So that's one thing, the capture by experts. I'm not saying it's impossible, but I think that's not what I've observed empirically. Another danger is that, um, in fact, it turns into another version of a star system. Um, for example, you know, it's true that in the French case, you've got very quickly a natural aristocracy of the citizens who sort of emerged and became very visible in the media, became very vocal during the plenaries. Uh, you know, one of them got a book deal out of this. Uh, you know, he founded uh, the, the association of the 150, became the president of that association, was kind of groomed by the uh, hosting institution to push for their own agenda. I mean, definitely this happens too. But again, is that worse than what's going on in the elected uh, uh, electoral system? I don't think so. And I, I don't think what we should expect um, sort of a, a randomly selected uh, citizens to be angels when no one else is, right? So sure, they get book deals. So sure, it will get to their head a little bit. And, and But at the end of the day, does it work or not? And, and of course, we can try to find ways to curb this a little bit. So for example, one of the citizens said that maybe we should not have those citizens assemblies last for too long, because it seems to be a general consensus, actually, in, a, in the participatory world, that after nine months, these people become too professionalized, too career oriented. They're starting to see how to game the system for their own benefit or to push a certain agenda. So if we want to preserve the, the, the naive take that's so valuable, maybe it can't last for too long. At the same time, I'm not convinced that um, uh, uh, we lose more than we gain by letting them get away with some of the stuff that elected officials get away with all the time. And nobody objects to that, right? Um, the fancy dinners, the nice uh, official cars, the, I mean, you know, private assistance. I mean, this would get to anybody's heads. We can't expect randomly selected citizens to be above these temptations. And uh, um, so I, I don't think that's such a worry. What would be other dangers? Um, um, the, 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 you know, the tyranny of the majority argument. So maybe that speaks to um, Ben's worry about, uh, you know, my, my, my this lack of supermajority role. Um, honestly, I think that randomly selected bodies tend to actually be very centrist in some ways. I mean, they, they bring people together towards a consensual position. So if anything, they fight polarization. Um, and I, you could say, well, um, they, they made decisions that were not necessarily uh, very, uh, uh, you know, socially, not seemingly socially acceptable. For example, in the French case, they recommended um, mandatory housing retrofitting by 2040, which is really like, you know, demanding of, of, uh, of, uh, of citizens. But that um, doesn't seem totally uh, socially unacceptable. We, we know from a Paris School of Economic Study that actually a lot of French people are sympathetic to that uh, reform. Uh, it's supposed to be accompanied by all kinds of uh, state aids and measures to facilitate this transition, which is costly, especially for um, you know, poor um, households. So it's not exactly tyrannical, even as it's quite coercive. Uh, and uh, again, I think that, yes, we, 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 we think that it's good to preserve the status quo and, and to slow down the, 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 the process of um, Policy making so that we don't make irreversible mistakes and all that. But I think that, again, it's a question of where you place the cursor. And I think for the last 200 years, we've placed the cursor too much in favor of the status quo uh, and established powerful elites. I think it, we could take the risk of pushing the cursor a little bit towards majoritarian preferences. Um, I think I'll stop here for this set of questions. Okay, great, excellent. So uh, we, we, we have two questions that are somewhat related, so I'm going to ask them together. One from Albert and one from an anonymous attendee. Right, so, so Albert's asking, uh, the Iceland constitution drafted by citizens was not adopted. So does this mean the exercise was not very successful? How do we evaluate the success of an experiment in open democracy? Uh, and the second question, maybe related to evaluating the success of experiment in open democracy is, do you think a deliberative process would have delivered a different outcome in referendum votes such as Brexit? Do you have any plans to do a comparative study, uh, perhaps across borders, where similar decisions are tackled differently in different countries? So do they achieve uh, similar outcomes or not? I guess I'll just add my own question, right? Which is, you know, given how polarized may, many of these discussions are, 
you know, can we expect deliberation to actually achieve anything? Because right? ultimately people are going to vote. And so, you know, do we think that deliberation is going to change uh, the way people think of uh, how they conceive of these policy questions? Okay, so it's a, a lot of questions. So, so the failure of Iceland, it's, it's very common objection. I, I think that when something's tried out for the first time, it's really rare that, that it works out. So I'm not shocked that it didn't go through. Um, when you look at the sort of political reasons for why it didn't go through, it, it's fairly predictable. There were strong economic interests uh, pushing against the, um, the constitutional reform in part because, uh, for example, there was an article in there, Article 34, that aimed to nationalize uh, natural resources that were not already privately owned, meaning mostly fishing grounds. Well, what that meant for very you know, rich uh, fishermen, I mean, they're not fishermen in the you know, picturesque sense, they're just big conglomerates, uh, that meant they would have to pay a rent to the Icelandic nation in order to be able to fish uh, on the you know, fertile Icelandic fishing grounds. And why would they want to do that? So you know, they, they, the, the Liberal Party very much opposed the, the constitutional reform. And to be fair, there were other reasons. It's not just... Uh, private interests, you know, pushing against the general will. I, I think, you know, the, the, this experiment was probably uh, not designed completely in the right way. I think that uh, the 25 uh, constitutional drafters worked perhaps too much in isolation from the rest of the system. They probably should have consulted more with parliamentarians and, and other um, officials to build a consensus, to to, to plan ahead of time the, the, the transition to a new system. And so this was probably a little too idealistic um, as, a, as, a, as a design. And so it's very inspiring for people like me, but you can see the problems in, in turning it into reality, for example, in getting from here to there. So I'm not shocked that the Icelandic case failed. I think uh, we cannot measure the impact of something like that just in terms of did it work or did it not work? You know, we have to look at what kind of inspiration did it become for the rest of the world? I think it has become an inspiration. That's something. Um, similarly, the French convention, you know, this past weekend, so I, I followed it, and this was the weekend where they were uh, allowed to vote on, uh, they were asked to vote um, about the, 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 whether or not the government had implemented the recommendations in the right way, and they could vote, you know, on a scale from zero to 10. And I think the grade that the government go got was like 2.3 out of 10 in terms of how good they did a, a job in terms of implementing the recommendations. But that said, when it came to um, the usefulness of uh, their convention to the fight for climate change in France, the grade was like 7.7, .7, much higher. So the impact is also that. It's also, what do you think this convention did for the education of the larger public in terms of understanding the fundamentals of climate change and the way the ways we can fight it so you you can look at the short term the you know the long term the immediate impact the sort of more diffuse impact and what's for sure is that you know um as one of the you know members of the french convention said he said look we we are going to be a model for future conventions we are going to be a model for convention in other countries. We are going to be viral in some ways, and, and that's very important. So it's another way of um, assessing impact and measuring success, I think. So would a deliberative referendum ha have yielded a different outcome in England? Honestly, I'm not sure. I think we, there, there's been enough elections at this point that seem to confirm that the, the British people were um, really fed up with the European Union. Um, I think to some degree for good reasons. I mean, if you if you think that um, the Brexit referendum was in part about democracy, they basically said no to a profoundly technocratic, opaque, closed off uh, system of governance. That's the European Union in a nutshell. Like, there's no denying that. So sure, if you're a liberal and you believe in uh, you know integration and, and open markets and all that then it's a total mistake to refuse to stay in the European Union. But if you're a small d Democrat and you believe in people's rule, I mean, there's a good case to be made that they might find a greater form of sovereignty, uh, perhaps not a great economic sovereignty, but some form of political sovereignty by leaving the EU. So I'm, I'm in favor of them staying. I was in favor of, uh, you know, of them staying myself, but um, I'm not sure that deliberate, more deliberation would have changed the outcome. It seemed to have come from a really 
strong uh, place of, uh, of rejection of the European Union model. Do I plan on doing comparative studies in other countries? I, I hope so. So it's very hard to do a, a strictly comparative studies because you know, in, in an ideal world, you would be able to run an experiment and then rerun it with slightly different you know, circumstances, but everything else uh, kept equal. I would say that the, the closest um, I got from that was the, during the French uh, Great National Debate in 2019. There were 21 randomly selected uh, regional conferences that were organized to discuss four topics, including the question of uh, the ecological transition. And 12 of them sort of converged on the same conclusion, which is that um, the French people wanted a different kind of democratic governance on climate issues. And that's apparently what convinced uh, President Macron to, to organize this uh, nationwide, uh, nation, national um, convention for climate. So, so I think you, you can, you, there is this element of comparison where you can say, well, actually, when you put certain citizens, citizens, random draws of citizens in roughly the same circumstances, they kind of converge on some conclusions. That's really interesting. Um, now, to go back to your question then about deliberation versus segregation and um, well, there's, uh, to me, I, I'm not sure I understand your worry here. I, I, I don't think deliberative Democrats believe that everything must be settled by deliberation alone. I think deliberation is just there to allow arguments to be exchanged. But at some point, when we are not making progress anymore, uh, when the burdens of judgment are too high and we just, we can't get through the, you know, the complications. Right. We, we vote and, and that's fine. And the aggregative phase is completely fine to me. As to the question um, about whether randomly selected citizens should vote in a sort of sociotropic way or in terms of who, you know, the, the, the constituency they represent because they're from a certain quota, you know. I again think it's, um, it's a very abstract question that I am not sure makes sense in practice. When, when people in these assemblies vote, they vote for what they think is true, correct, right uh, for the group. Yes, um, they don't vote in a, in a in this sort of narrowly self-interested way or this uh, partisan or or a corporatist way. Oh, I'm 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 a, I'm a representative of the youth, so I'm going to vote what the youth would want me to vote. No, they 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 don't make that calculation. They I think they cal they, they they vote what they think is right, and and so in fact. One thing that's often uh, confusing to people is that they think, oh, you, you brought in these people because they are um, young and they think a certain way, they have certain views that we can measure on certain points. But then once they go into these deliberative processes, their views evolve. So they are no longer representative because they've changed their minds. I think that's a mistake. We don't choose them for the views they hold. We choose them for the way they think because of who they are. And the way they think is not gonna change. It stays cons constant throughout the process but they will change the content of their beliefs, right? And that's, that's not an issue for me. I, of course, the point of deliberation is to change minds. If people came in, if we wanted people not to change their minds, then we just wouldn't let them deliberate at all, right? So I think they're representative of the larger group for the cognitive diversity they bring, for the, the specific ways they will process information, not for the pre-held, pre-deliberative beliefs or um, you know, their identification with a particular group or this and that. In fact, the use of quotas, I think it's unavoidable because these groups are, are usually too small to, to generate, uh, too, too small for the, for the random draw to generate a representative sample. So we need to engineer the diversity a little bit. But that's not ideal. That's a departure from the ideal. In the ideal, it's one person when, when lottery tickets so that you don't have to essentialize people. And that a woman is not here as a representative of women or a, or a, or a, you know, a black person is not here as a representative of black people. It's, it's that, that's essentializing people in a way. And, and I think the, the beauty of lot is that it's blind. It's not, you know, it's not essentializing people. Um, so the fact that we have to do it a little bit because we, we don't, so far we don't know how to run you know, deliberation in the thousands because it's very costly and, and complicated. 
we have to engineer the sample a bit, but I think we should avoid essentializing people and saying things like, oh, you're, you're, you know, you're the vegetarian. You have to speak on behalf of vegetarians. You know, it's just, I, I think that's, uh, that's not a good approach. Excellent. Hello. So I understand it a lot better now. So the representatives don't really have a constituency, right? They're there no. citizens and, and they're there to basically deliberate and express their views uh, at the end of the day. And the ideal is they would vote based on what they think is, is, is right. Yeah. Okay, excellent. So uh, maybe I'll just uh, abuse my privilege and put in a question before uh, getting one more from the audience. Uh, and the question I had, you know, actually I want to defend uh, Helen. It's true that the uh, constitution wasn't adopted, but I'm not sure that, uh, that that's really bad uh, for the argument being advanced, right? Because as I understand it, open democracy is being uh, advocated on, on two grounds, really. Uh, can people hear me? Yes, in, uh, okay. you froze for a minute. So. Okay, <laughs> yeah, so, so I understand open democracy is being defended on two normative grounds. Uh, first is uh, more legitimate. Uh, because it's inclusive and equal. And I think that's not something that's susceptible of empirical proof. I mean, that's just a, a normative argument, if I understand correctly. And the second one is the epistemic argument. Uh, and then the question is, uh, did they make a better uh, constitution, right? And uh, there is a colorable argument they did in terms of the rights they included. Uh, and the fact that it wasn't adopted by, uh, you know, uh, the career politicians, I think shows to me the promise of open democracy, right? that we could have a system that would generate, you know, outcomes that are not the same as what our elected politicians that would give us that, you know, in a sense are more legitimate and more, uh, and, and more in a sense correct, I mean, if I may use the term. So, so it's well, been... yeah, sorry. Oh, sorry, I, did, I didn't hear the end of what you were saying, but I was just thinking, you know, uh, yeah. In terms of the, the comparison uh, between you know, what you get when you let those citizens uh, decide and when you let career politicians decide, I think this was beautifully illustrated in the case of the French Convention. The, the 150 citizens came up with really you know, ambitious proposals to curb green gas emissions by 40% of the 1990s levels by 2030 in a spirit of social justice. They did. Experts ranked and, and sort of graded their proposals and, and they, they tried to assess, I mean, this is very imprecise science, but how much carbon emissions would be curbed by each proposal. The big one, the big one, the big lever of this convention to curb the gas emissions was um, mandatory housing retrofitting, you know, by a certain date. Because uh, I think uh, carbon emissions uh, uh, through housing are, are huge big portion of, of uh, French green gas emissions. Well, what the French government did with that idea is that it completely ignored it. That's the one that they didn't take on board. I mean, they, they decided they would um, retrofit only 90,000 housings um, in France. And that's, that's way too little. It's, it's gonna barely dent uh, green gas emissions. So that, that you can measure the difference between career politicians and, and citizens right there. Even as they were pushed and encouraged and, and uh, pressured by this convention to do better. Excellent. Uh, so, so let's move on to another question from the audience. We're slightly, uh, we're gonna run out of time soon. So let me ask a question from the audience. Uh, another challenge to democracy is the increasing complexity of matters, the interconnectedness of issues, uh, the short versus long-term perspective. How can open democracy help all representatives in the wider sense to propose uh, grapple with uh, complexity, you know, and I'll just add here, for example, even in a professional, you know, Senate, uh, senators, you know, uh, congressmen, they are often on committees, right, because it's not possible for any, any one person to specialize in everything that may come before the House. Uh, so, so what about uh, th these representatives, right, how, how are they going to grapple with all the complexity of, of uh, the it's issues that question. concern us today? Again, I'm glad the, this person brought up the comparison point because the fact is that elected officials, you know, especially in the US, spend so much time raising funds, campaigning, shaking hands, making calls. They actually have very little time for actual policy making and, and, and facing the complexity of, of uh, technical legislation. So what do they do? They outsource the writing to lobbyists, um, to experts, and then they make the law by signing it, right? So. Comparatively, all the citizens um, who themselves come from all kinds of professional backgrounds, you know, are, you have engineers, you have biologists, you have doctors, you have nurses, you have 
um, chemistry students, you have bringing a ton of expertise. They're not necessarily worse in terms of the, the brain power they bring to these issues as a group. They are probably less educated on specific issues, but uh, in seven weekends, you saw how 150 of those people in France were capable of catching up on a lot of, of technical issues with the massive help of experts. But still, I mean, this is the same kind of help that we have no problem letting elect elected officials availing themselves of. And yet we don't say, oh, they, they are being co-opted by the experts and they, they, they're not making the law. So, so I think that um, the complexity is a problem. It's a, it's a difficulty for everyone, but I don't think it's, it's worse for um, randomly selected citizens than it is for elected officials. Um, additionally, I would say that we can decide as a society that there's a division of labor and that at some point it's too complex, so we let the experts decide. Let's say uh, that's kind of what we decided on economic matters like interest rates. Where we have a Fed, we have a central bank, uh, that that's just, these choices are out of the hands of majorities and legislators or the, the representatives of the people. Same thing on um, the Food and Drug Administration. I mean, in fact, there are tons of groups in our in our democracies that make these decisions in a non-democratic manner because we think it's too complex. Uh, in this pandemic, we you know in France, we for a long time we let the, the committee of scientific uh, scientists make and dictate the, the decisions of the government about what to do about the confinement, uh, the curfew, um, you know, and it, it backfired. People were not happy. Uh, this was not responsive to people's needs. It was unfair in some ways. So now the French government has decided that precisely to accompany the, uh, the, the, the scientists, they, they appointed a, a randomly selected a sample of 35 citizens so that at least citizens voice is heard even on, on seemingly technical an issue like uh, the management of the vaccination campaign, right? Uh, so there, there's that. So I think we, in the past, we've we've divided the labor in such a way that we've probably given away too much power to experts. Um, I'm not saying that complexity is not an issue, but I, I feel like it's often a, a justification for emptying, uh, you know, the core of, of, of legislative power or democratic power of content, and then that has cost and, it, and is dangerous. I think that's what happened with the European Union, uh, where most of the power is in the hands of the central bank and the European Commission. Um, we, I think we need to reclaim some of that power despite the complexity. And finally, I would say that again, I, when I think of a, of a center, central open mini public, it's really to face not so much the complexity, but the uncertainty of the world. You, you have things arriving to us as a community, as a polity, left and right. Pandemic, a, a financial crisis, an, a problem of uh, aging demographics, um, you know, uh, robots and AI taking over our jobs. And, 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 you know, so who's to say that, you know, they have all the answers? No one can claim that. So we have to address this bundle of issues all at once as a community. And then we can decide as a second step, okay, on AI and robots, we're going to have a commission to explore the implications. But that, even that doesn't mean they should decide. They should report and let the citizens decide, to my mind. Right, right. Thank, thank you, Helen. You know, uh, on that point, I'll, I'll just say too, because you know, that's something I feel as well. Right? I, I feel there is scientific complexity, there's factual uncertainty, but there's also you know, uncertainty and debate about values. Right? So ultimately, yeah. you know, for example, a decision about should we fight the virus at all costs, even if it means jobs will be lost, you know, I think the economists can come up with estimates, right? The best estimates, but ultimately at the heart of it is really a question about, uh, about values, right? Uh, it's really about, it's a normative judgment. And I just wonder, you know, whether there are really any experts in that. And, and so I, I fully agree actually with your point uh, that maybe in the name of complexity, we've delegated too much uh, to experts because I don't think of economists as experts in, in, in value judgments. Uh, okay, so we're near the end of our time, uh, we do have one more question, and this is a good question to wrap things up. Uh, so what institutional reforms would you propose to make people's motivation grow in the coming years uh, to cultivate the emergency? Uh, I'm sorry, us... I, I'm sorry, uh, Ben, I didn't hear you. You got cut off, so I only found okay. the beginning. What institutional reforms would you recommend for? Uh, to, make, to grow people's motivation to cultivate the emergence of open democracy. 
Uh, so what, what kind of reforms could we do to uh, prepare people for open democracy, make them embrace it, you know, practical uh, steps? I think, uh, you know, I, I think you need a generational change. I think the people who are in power right now, at least a certain generation, are not going to embrace that no matter what. So you have to start with the youth. And I think uh, schools are good places to start experimenting with that. Like instead of electing class delegates, for example, a horrible experience I had when I was 12, I was elected class delegate. And overnight, I lost ha half of my friends. I gained others who were just, you know, founding and, and not insincere. It was just terrible. I, I, I think a lot of my <laughs> political beliefs stem from that original experience. I think we should uh, have class delegates that are randomly selected. And, and rotated so that everyone gets a chance to be elected. And that the shy kid in the corner who doesn't stand a chance in an election, he gets a chance and he gets to experience that and he gets to bring their point of view. And I think you would have class delegate that would be a lot less male, uh, alpha, uh, you know, entitled. And, and that, that, I mean, and that would sort of start a conversion to more inclusive and egalitarian ideals that can then be applied in the, you know, in the private sphere, uh, in your family, also in, in, uh, in, in the economic world, in firms, hopefully some, you know, unfortunately our, our companies are, are built after a totally oligarchic, top-down, vertical, feudal sort of a model. So that's going to take a long time to reform. And, but, but if we can start, you know, implementing these things at, at the small scale everywhere, hopefully then you, you've got citizens who are ready to ask for more at the political level. Um, I think reading, educating yourself about, you know, all these alternative models, there's a whole literature out there. I really am not the only one. Uh, it's a growing minority and, uh, and I think it's slowly actually get going mainstream. And so I'm, I'm hopeful that in the next uh, 10 years, we we're going to make progress on, on this front. Okay, uh, excellent. Can people hear me? I think my connection is a little unstable. All right, okay, so uh, excellent. So we should probably wrap up. I'll just add I was a class delegate as well. Uh, I was in charge of the money. And people kept asking me, what, what are you doing for all the money? Because I keep collecting more from them. And, you know, I just wish everyone had a turn so they could see how hard it is trying to keep the class budget well, exactly. balanced. Exactly. And that would, that would take the wind <laughs> out of this criticism because it's so much easier to criticize when you know you'll never occupy that position. But if you actually have to occupy it or anticipate occupying it, you have a lot more sympathy for, for the hard work that, that, that politics involves, actually. All right, great. So we've come to the end. It's six thirty. So thank you so much, uh, Helen, for joining us. And you know, everyone, if you thank haven't you bought a copy, you know, uh, please please do get a copy. You know, it's fascinating reading. I'm learning so much uh, just from going through this book. So th thank you so much, Helen. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Bye, thank you, Helen. Bye bye.